with a local community cafe to organize an event. And at the beginning, the event programmer turned to me and said, you look like an Egyptian princess. No lead in, no context, just completely out the blue. Now I found this fascinating because many things are bound up in this comment that I am a woman, that I am a young woman, and that I am other, in this case, Egyptian, which I'm not. So what did I do? I hoisted a smile onto my face, I laughed, and I moved the conversation along. I performed the emotional labor of mitigating an unwelcome comment. I contained the hot barb of a microaggression to my own body. And women of color do this every day. Now, I wanted to start with this example because I want to explore how emotional labor is not an issue of interpersonal conflicts. It's an issue of structural inequality. This interaction only happened because I am a young woman of color. There's no way that I could have or would have ever said an equivalent statement to him, an older white man. This interaction, then, is a microcosmic reflection of the structures of oppression that we navigate every day. Now, I define emotional labor as the emotionally charged care work, which is disproportionately performed by women, unpaid. So this work can look like sending a birthday card, buying birthday and holiday gifts on behalf of a partner or loved one, project managing childcare, hosting guests, standing on a stage unpaid and explaining what emotional labor is, <laughs> acting as a cheerleader and advisor for those around you. And this work is frequently belittled and invisibilized because it is not recognized as work, which contributes to an economy, it is often unpaid. And in the absence of a wage relation, the worker will find it difficult to find terms and grounds upon which they can struggle against their own exploitation. But this is not a new idea. So in the early 1980s, a sociologist called Arlie Hochschild was trying to make emotional labor happen as a concept, like the Gretchen Wiener of the sociology world. She wrote a book in 1984 called The Managed Heart. And in this book, she explores how flight attendants and bill collectors were using emotional labor in their daily work. They were simulating emotions that they weren't actually feeling as part of their daily duties. Now, I would argue that the concept of emotional labor is present about 10 years earlier in the 1970s. A Marxist feminist, academic and activist called Silvia Federici wrote an essay called Wages Against Housework. Now, Federici was a member of the International Feminist Collective which led the charge on the campaign for wages for housework. And in her essay, she describes what she calls the particular combination of physical, emotional, and sexual tasks performed by women for capital. In her book, she says we must make visible the unpaid labor of women by demanding wages as the first step towards refusing to do that work. But I'd like to go further into Federici's broader argument and explore some of the nuances within it. So within the campaign for wages for housework, there were other collectives, such as the International Black Women for Wages for Housework, based in New York and Los Angeles. And the International Black Women drew a connection between resisting women's role within capital and demands for reparations for slavery, neo-imperialism, and colonialism. So they saw a link between women's unpaid work and racist structural inequality. What they were using was the frame of intersectionality in their work. And this is a term that would later be coined by a black feminist academic called Kimberly Crenshaw. She used the term intersectionality to articulate what happens when different sites of oppression, such as sexism and racism, crash together or intersect, meaning that a person who is both a woman and a black person can be subjected to a particular type of violence, and they might experience that violence in a specific way. So I would argue we have to use this framework of intersectionality if we really want to understand the breadth and the depth 
of emotional labor. And I'll give two examples. So the first one, in 2016, a black feminist organization called IMCAN, which is dedicated to addressing violence against black and minoritized women and girls, conducted research into women and girls' experiences of racialized sexual harassment. Now this is relevant to our thinking around emotional labor because the act of mitigating harassment is labor, by which I mean smiling at someone who is harassing you on a street is labor. Humoring someone who is coming up to you and asking if you have a partner and if so, where they are, is labor. That's work, it takes energy, and it drains and distracts us from the things we'd rather be doing. So in this research, one interviewee said, my automated response is to act like it's fine, whereas actually it's really affected me. Another interviewee said, I was called a black whore in a club because I wouldn't give my number to a guy whose only approach to me was to grab my body without my consent. A third interviewee said, because they have spoken to you, you must speak to them. There is an expectation that we must mitigate the harassment we receive because we are women and because we are women of color. A fourth interviewee said, there is a perception that because I am a black woman, I am fair game and I must be up for it. This perception of black women's autonomy stems right back to transatlantic slavery and the colonial projects, to the systematic devaluation of black womanhood for white profit and male gratification. We can also think about the experiences of migrant women and their performance of emotional labor. In fact, much is written about migrant women domestic workers' emotional labor in the workplace. But I think we need to ask the same questions again. So how does capitalism and inequality prescribe emotional labor for migrant women in public spaces and interpersonal settings. So I interviewed one woman from Malaysia who grew up in a small town in the UK. And she told me about always being stared at and people always making comments. She always felt like a minority, like she was trying to fit in. She was constantly trying to vault over language barriers and navigate social cues. She was constantly correcting and amending her family's behavior in public settings. And she had to be very empathetic and observant in order to do this. What this means is she was acting as a social lubricator, picking up English quickly by necessity in order to understand what was going on. So as migrant women, there is a burden on them to perform emotional labor. And this work is by no means trivial. It's actually crucial to survival. So the interviewee spoke about being very present to the real threats of living in the UK as a migrant woman. In the months following the EU referendum, reported hate crimes rose by 100%. This means that from a young age, emotional labor is baked in to her social interactions. She has to make her presence amenable to others ensuring they are at ease and accepting of her being there. There is an emotional burden on migrant women to perform this labor, and the stakes, whether they perform this work or not, are high. What I'm trying to illustrate here is that the feminized burden of emotional labor is not an interpersonal issue, it's one of structural inequality. And these inequalities root back to things like caste discrimination, colorism, colonialism, misogyny, slavery, and capitalism, which defines some bodies as valuable and others as more disposable. This means we can identify a relationship between public spending cuts in the UK and the emotional burden on women to fill the gaping chasms in public services with unpaid care and assistance. Now these funding cuts are by no means random and apolitical, so there was research conducted by the Women's Budget Group and the Runnymede Trust. And this research showed that the government planned to increase spending on defense by one billion pounds by 2020. On top of this, they planned a 178 billion pound high-tech equipment plan. At the very same time, black families in the poorest fifth of households were set to experience an 8.4,000 pound decrease in living standards on year per average. Now this is a clear 
demonstration of where priorities lie. Mental health trusts report operating on the same level of finance that they had in 2012 because of cuts in funds. At the same time, the amount of young people presenting at A&E with psychiatric concerns has doubled. So what happens then when the government cuts public spending on our services is that women step in to fill the breach because we are apparently inherently caring, naturally nurturing, and biologically programmed to prioritize other people's needs. But this, as a process, is not sustainable, and the results can be fatal. The emphasis on self-care emerges out of a capitalistic context where the only people caring for us as women living at the intersections of different oppressions are ourselves. So what's the solution then? We need to examine how public funds are being spent. Look at how public policies, particularly ones around employment and parental leave, are reinforcing inequality in heteropatriarchy. And these conversations cannot solely revolve around the gender pay gap and representation in boardrooms and other such tunes from the white feminist songbook. We need to abolish prisons which criminalize, lacerate, and economically deprive our communities, meaning that the burden of care falls on unsupported individuals. We need to fight back against immigration controls, which are expressions of historical colonial power thinly veiled with fictions about whose labor is and isn't valuable. It's only from this radical position that we can start to shift the debate around emotional labor. Black feminist scholar Bell Hook said, any successful mass movement must be built from the margins to the center. At the same time, in 1984, Wilmet Brown, an anti-war activist and member of the Black Panther Party said, to free women is to free men. What this means is, we should consider decentering the perspectives of middle-class, white, cisgender, straight, able-bodied women in our discussions of emotional labor. Not because these perspectives don't matter or because they're not important, but because, as indigenous activist Leela Watson said, your liberation is bound up with mine. If we liberate from the margins, freedoms flow into the mainstream. Because emotional labor is work, and I would invite you to recognize the role of the state in our toil. As women living at the intersections of different oppressions, we have a heavier burden to carry. So as feminists, I would encourage us to come together to lighten the load. <laughs>